Hi, everyone, and uh, many thanks for the, to the organizers for this opportunity to join in the celebration of 25 years of genome biology and technology. I'm Professor Aurelie Alter, and I will be celebrating with multi-tensor AI ML, that's artificial intelligence and machine learning, that is uniquely able to identify actionable and mechanistically interpretable predictors from small cohort and noisy, high-dimensional, multi-omic clinical data, the data that we're all very excited about that's coming up, and I guess to some extent has been going around. And I should mention that I'm also the CSO of Prism AI Therapeutics. And uh, this AI ML is um, quantum mechanics-based AI ML that's underlying our platform to help your drug development and biomarker development. And uh, so for full disclosure, uh, if I were to choose a, a walk-up song, I would choose uh, maybe um, in honor of you and Bernie here, <laughs> the Rolling Stones' uh, Emotional Rescue, or maybe Sam and Dave, Hold On, I'm Coming, because uh, as um, we were told by David Altschuler, still drugs continue to fail clinical trials and post-market validation. I'm even more conservative. I have it at 95. I guess he had it, sorry, at 90. He had it at 95. And um, you might say, why is prediction in medicine so limited still, so that we have so much failure um, and we cannot get the drugs that would help patients to the clinic? And we might say, well, we're uh, 20 years after the human genome, and now we have the whole multiome coming, and we know that the whole multiome affects disease. So can we use the whole multiome to actually help clinical trials and drug development and biomarker development, and my team would want me to emphasize that we are uniquely able to discover these kind of predictors that consistently validate across studies and over time in federated small cohort noisy and high dimensional multi-omic clinical data. And that's in support of your drug development and biomarker development. And you might say, what is it about your AI ML that's special? Where our, our AI ML, it comes from physics. And again, uh, as a shout out uh, to David Altschuler, it's interesting how physicists and geneticists might think alike because he seemed to be um, interested in understanding in order to predict and control. And in physics, we understand, predict, and control, say, the world from the planetary to the atomic level. So, for example, uh, granted, it took 360 years, but going from Brahe's data to uh, Kepler's mathematics for discovery and validation of patterns in the data, we were able to have a man not just make it to the moon, but actually walk on the moon, um, which is fantastic control. So can we hopefully do the same in molecular biology. And I was thinking this question when I was just finishing my PhD on quantum mechanics, and um, that was the early days of the Human Genome Project, and I said, well, um, let's give it a try. So starting with the mathematics that underlies uh, physics, this is spectral decomposition, where, say, it takes in a white light and separates it into its color um, ingredients or, or components. We then uh, generalize in order to enable, integrate multiple signals. So now it's not just the white light that goes into the prism, our prism AI, but it's all the different um, uh, signals that make up, uh, say, the, uh, uh, the flow of, the genetic inf of genetic information in the cell. So DNA, RNA, proteins, and everything that you all so fantastically can measure, possibly by just one platform these days. And we have all these mathematical structures in place where we start with just one data set, where we invented the eigengene, but then quickly added additional data sets to integrate them together, and then had uh, these data sets so that uh, they have shared access, maybe the access of patients, and independent access, which are the access of the different features in the data that you might want to measure. And I won't go into all of these mathematics because I really don't have time, but I just want to say that if you're interested in the mathematics, uh, join us next week at the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics meeting uh, where I'll discuss uh, 
more about the mathematical aspects. The bottom line is that we now proved properties, defined metrics, and highlighted the connections to quantum mechanical concepts that um, enable us to build models from the very uh, unique multi-omic data. Why do I say unique? It's because the data are skinny, very few samples, billions of features, um, and so for example, and then there's uh, batch effects that we're all very much aware of, there are normal variations, and there's so very many unknowns. So just to talk about this aspect, it would mean that we would need, say, more than three billion patient training sets to generate models with uh, neural networks and deep learning from the three billion nucleotide genome alone. That's not even taking into account all of the noise and um, all of the unknowns um, if you want to be sure that the model is able to converge. So we have uh, mathematics that will converge that will give you a unique solution, which is what the world really is. Your data are composed of actual unique phenomena and uh, is by definition lossless, so you don't actually lose anything when you use the mathematics. And um, we have shown that these models present a coherent and consistent picture of those data, including simultaneously the systematic batch effects, say in one uh, color of light, the normal demographic variation in another color of light, and um, the disease-specific predictors and their interactions. So we could do this with just 50 to 100 patients, is what we used to say up to today. And uh, after this one year of our PRISM AI therapeutics, where we completed a case study with the NCI, I could tell you that it went down to 19. Let me quickly show you what the process looks like in one example, and hopefully I'll get to talk about the other um, use cases we've completed in this year. So in this one example, we discovered in an 85 uh, patient NCI study and experimentally validated in a 79 patient Utah trial, a predictor of survival and response in glioblastoma. And just to put this in context, for 70 years, the best indicator of a patient's survival and response has been age. With all the data that we accumulated and recurring DNA copy number alterations, not mutations, DNA copy number alterations, so the different modalities actually matter, have been recognized as a hallmark of cancer and observed in uh, GBM and all other attempts to associate those uh, CNAs with the patient outcome failed. So starting with these minimally processed tumor and blood profiles, so every study that I'm going to show you here actually takes in different modalities from different tissues. Um, we were able to blindly, that is in an unsupervised manner, and without any a priori knowledge or assumption, remove batch effects. So uh, afterwards, we we're able to associate those batch effects, for example, here in, in the tumors, with, uh, say, GC uh, content variation, which uh, I know you all very much uh, studied to detail. For example, uh, Michael Schatz here, who I know is on the organizing committee. So. Um, it's fantastic to understand when, where those batch effects come from, but for our mathematics, we don't really need to know this, just making an emphasis on this. Then blindly, and again, without feature engineering, again, without making any assumptions, we're able to separate normal demographic variations. So specifically here, we're able to separate X chromosome variation in copy numbers, which is appearing clearly in the normal genomes, but is to some extent also preserved in the tumor genomes without really knowing anything about it as far as the mathematics goes, uh, which means that we're able to incorporate all of the data that you measure, not just the different layers and different modalities, but the data from all those regions in the genome that for some reason saw very many pipelines throughout. Um, and then we repeatedly discovered and validated the predictor in different data sets. So in Illumina data sets, in Affymetrix data sets, in Agilent data sets. And if you want to get a model that actually takes all of your different data into account, even in a federated manner, and gets at the same biology, 
we have the mathematics for it. We're able to interpret our, our model. Our models are interpretable. I'll get to that uh, some more soon. I just want to mention that we continued with the Utah trial, and then we retrospectively validated that the predictor is most accurate. It is uh, most precise, uh, so it's got fantastic reproducibility. Here I'm showing you two whole genome sequencing uh, platforms from Illumina and from Complete Genomics at BGI Shenzhen. We actually tested this on other sequencing technologies that uh, at the moment I cannot show you here. And uh, we had 100% reproducibility for whole genome sequencing. The less than 100%, uh, which is why I'm saying they're greater than 99%, uh, it comes from the microarray data, incorporating the microarray data. So uh, we are able to show that we have here information that's statistically independent of all standard of care indicators and contains information that was not in the clinic until now. And finally, we were able to prospectively validate the predictor for the patients who were still alive at the time when we made the prediction. I want to mention that we have results in ovarian cancer and specifically results for predictors that are encompassed in genomic regions that normally are being thrown out, um, such as the X chromosome. Um, we have results for lung and uterine adenocarcinomas as well. We have results for neuroblastoma. Um, some of them are still under revision. Uh, and I want to emphasize that, uh, yes, I'm showing you a whole genome predictor. Clearly, we know it's the whole multiome. And uh, also, I want to emphasize that it's fantastic to be able to interpret uh, those predictors, besides making a prediction, actually, that it's interpretable. And I want to tell you that coming up, if you're all at AACR, I would be very happy to show you the data where we experimentally validated that the predictor correctly discovered unrecognized drug targets in GBM, specifically genes that are required for the tumor cell proliferation and viability. And again, uh, I guess traditional AI, ML, neural networks, and deep learning are probably not going to enable you to interpret your results. This um, adds to previous uh, experiments that we did uh, with John Diffley at Cancer Research UK, where we experimentally showed that our computationally predicted mechanisms are correct. Um, we have the project with the NCI that I mentioned earlier, where we are able to identify a predictor in a very small cohort, clinical trial phase, zero clinical trial, where you can already get some insights into the patient's response and survival. And it's a trial um, for a combination therapy trial. It's a tumor agnostic collection of just 19 patients and also for multi-center patients. So all the noises in the world that you can imagine are on this data, but we're able to find a predictor, and the beauty of it here is that we don't just discover, but we validate, kind of like Kepler. Then we discovered and validated actionable, mechanistically interpretable transcriptome predictors of survival in response to immunotherapy from real-world clinical trial data. Uh, again, uh, this kind of predictor can actually help drugs that had to be withdrawn from the market to stay on the market and make it to the patients that they would actually help. And uh, I want to emphasize for all of you who think that that means it's going to be less patients, that this is not correct. We actually find that in our, predict our predictors suggest additional patients that drug, drug might help that are currently not being uh, targeted or selected for the trials. Um, so uh, I'm uh, very happy again to um, ask you to join us in working, you know, to cure disease and uh, to uh, let you know that we have the platform to support your drug and biomarker development for all different stages of clinical trials where we're uniquely able to discover and validate predictors 
in separate data sets that are sep uh, federated, small cohort, noisy, and high dimensional multi omic clinical data. Our algorithms are data agnostic, actually, and um, also clearly batch and demographics agnostic, and they find what other algorithms miss. So much of the data that I've shown you today are out there in uh, publicly available data sets, and nobody else found them so far. The predictors are mechanistically interpretable. They're actionable in the general populations. And again, every time we have a predictor, we can show that it outperforms all others where they exist. So uh, let's cure disease together and stay healthy. And let me thank um, our team and all of our collaborators. And in honor of Rick Wilson here, I also want to mention that we have a fantastic collaboration with uh, the team uh, of Jay Bowen at Nationwide Children's Hospital. So thank you.